So today we are going to continue our discussion of LC3 as a case study in investigating our computer systems. Today we're going to look at trap subroutines and standard subroutines. Right, uh, trap subroutines and standard subroutines are similar in concept. And their overall application though is different. This is the difference is simply whether we have a operating system service routine, which is often referred to as a trap routine, and, and a subroutine, which would be a user space subroutine. So the differentiation between these two types of subroutines is where they exist in memory and whether they are protected in memory, whether they are a, a protected portion of the operating system or whether they exist in the user space. Right. Within these slides, I don't go over the memory map. However, you guys will read over it in Pat and Patel. And there's also some supplementary PDF documents on the course website, which detail uh, the memory map for the LC3 architecture and identify which spaces are reserved for the trap table, which spaces are reserved for the operating system, right, and which memory spaces are reserved for user space. Right. We've already learned of some special purpose registers which have reservations, right? namely we talked about some of the IO registers which are mapped to memory. So memory location, for example, FE00 is protected because it is the, well, I believe it was the data register for the keyboard. Right? And with that in mind, I encourage you guys to continue on with the reading. So let's go ahead and bring this up to full screen and I'll share the full screen. You guys can see it a little bit better. Let's see, where is that full screen? There it is. All right, so continue on with the readings. Uh, again, recall that the, uh, you have a project to do soon and one on the horizon. Again, these projects are pretty small, but you should certainly allocate four to five hours at least to complete them and to write up the report. So for our talk today, we're going to go over the trap routines and user subroutines, uh, compare and contrast, and look at some of the protocols necessary to pass arguments and return return values. And so there's a, a lot of you know, magic that goes on behind the scenes with respect to function calls. Uh, at high level languages, right, you are oblivious to some of these lower level details but you are fully aware of the concept. Right? If I say that you've defined a function and that function takes parameters and you invoke that function, you know that you're gonna to have to pass values to those parameters in order to execute that function. Well, how are those parameters passed? Right? Is this something that the computer just magically does? Right? And this is something that needs to be done at the lower level, at the assembly level, at the binary level, right? at the programming level that we've been working at thus far. Right. So somewhere in memory or using a register, right, these parameters, these values are gonna have to be passed from a caller to a callee function. Right. And similarly, return values are gonna have to be passed back to the caller. There's also a number of other pieces of information that are, need to be, that are going to need to be maintained in order to facilitate the passing of control to the callee and the returning of control back to the caller. And, and so we're going to look at some of these details here right, within our discussion of subroutines. Mm -hmm. Lastly, if we have time, we'll look at what happens when subroutines call subroutines and what could go wrong. So go ahead and dive on in. Here's where we exist on our bird's eye view of our computer system. We'll dive into chapter nine material now. And so first, uh, Pat and Patel likes to discuss this from the perspective of the system call first and then user space subroutines, which is okay, I suppose. Right. So a system call is a particular type of call or subroutine call. Right. In, in particular, and to motivate this concept, certain operations require specialized knowledge and protection we already saw a really good example of this with the IO systems. And if you, the programmer, wanted to print something to the screen, 
it's great to just say C out and then pass in a string, right? That makes the printing really easy. Right? However, if you had to be privy to all the low level details of the IO system so that you use the data register and the status register for the display con console uh, IO device, right? That would make programming print statements a lot more tedious, right? right? And so for that reason, and for many others, it's important that we have some sort of intermediary managing system, if you will, to obfuscate those lower level details from higher level processes or, and or programmers like us. Right. And so this requires some level of protection. What is that level of protection? Well, this protection is generally provided by the operating system and some form of memory management, right? That is memory protection scheme. Right. So some of these service routines, such as drivers for display systems and or keyboard uh, IO devices and so on and so forth, are referred to as service routines or system calls. They are part of the operating system and operate or exist in privileged locations and memories, privileged and or protected. How do system calls work? Well, if you want to access an IO device or some other protected device, you would simply do this not by directly accessing the device, but rather making the appropriate call to the system service routine. So the user would simply just invoke a system call, right? the operating system then takes over and performs the operation and then hands control back to the user program. And this is done through a trap mechanism. Right? And we'll learn about that mechanism in the following slides. Again, like many of the concepts in this course, we're going to learn it via a case study in our LC3 right, to provide intuition. Right, our LC3 trap mechanism consists of a set of service routines. Right? These service routines are a part of, an operating, of the operating system and exist in addresses uh, that are protected within the memory protection scheme. There is a slight difference between PINSIM's protection scheme and Pat Patel's protection scheme, but that's not important. So how do we access these subroutines? Well, by the standard protocol for LC3, our trap table exists at memory location zero through FF. What is a trap table? Well, this trap table is simply a table of memory addresses where all the subroutines, right, all the trap service routines begin in memory. Right, so for example, subroutine number one might be, or the uh, entry in table one might be the memory location where the service routine to access the data display may exist. Right. Or table entry number two, might be where uh, might store the memory location where the service routine to pull the next key from the keyboard stroke exists. Right. How can the user access these or make these calls explicitly? Well, often there is some sort of trap instruction to do so, and our instruction set architecture has that. And within our trap instructions, we have the ability to index into the 256 table entries, that is hex FF, and simply access one of these possible service routines. All right, so this solves the idea of, or the problem of invoking the function or invoking a subroutine. But it doesn't necessarily solve the problem of how we return control back to the user. So, this way, this is what we'll refer to as the way back, and this way back must be stored. What do we mean by way back? Right? Well, when the user or some routine or some program calls a service routine, its execution is halted and control is handed over 
to the service routine. In a perfect world, we would like this user program to then continue executing at that same location once the service routine has completed executing. So this way back should store the PC value right, where, or when I should say, the user program halted. Right? Thus, we can reset the PC appropriately when the service routine completes executing. Does that make sense to everyone? And so again, it's just sort of holding, keeping track of where, you know, which instruction we want to execute next once the service routine completes executing. And we'll refer to this as the way back. Right? I have a few illustrative slides coming up, which may also help explain this concept. Yeah, so James asked the good question, right? So where is this going to be saved? Where is it going to be stored? Right? That is the question, James. So let's look at different places where we can store this way back. Right. No, it wasn't this slide, James. So we'll have to wait a few more slides. Right. So here are some of the common traps that are specified in Patent Patel. Right. By standard, at table index number 20, also simply referred to as trap 20, we have the get character service routine. And this is the service routine that reads in a single character from the keyboard data register, simply called get C. And so there is a pseudo op for it. Right? And there is right, the command trap, the assembly command trap 20. Similarly, we have a service routine for out, which writes out to the monitor. Put S, which writes a string to the monitor. In, which prompts and writes. And halt, which you guys have seen. Right? The fact that these are placed in these particular entries in the table are arbitrary. It's just by standard. And you could place them wherever you want, as long as you have an assembler that makes the appropriate translation. And in our LC3, the instruction for a trap is simply 1111. Since we have 256 possible service routines, we then need to have eight bits to index into our trap table. And so the least significant eight bits indicate which service routine we want to run. And bits 11 through 8 are not used. And now to answer James' question, when a trap instruction is executed, we need to save the value of the PC at that moment. So that needs to be saved. Where are we going to save it? By standard in our LC3, it's going to get saved automatically into R7. So if you call a trap function, right, it will our trap service routine will automatically place the PC value in R7 and then overwrite the PC appropriately. Right, so what does that mean? Well, let's look at this illustration before we have any questions. Right, so first things first, save the way back. Right, so as soon as a trap function or a trap service routine is encountered, we save the way back in R7. Next, we determine which service routine is going to be run. We simply identify the index into the trap table that's sent to the memory address register. We then go to that location in memory. And so this location in memory is the trap table and the particular entry in the trap table, which stores the memory address of the service routine we want to execute. And so what does that mean? Well, we want to begin executing at that address. So how do we do that? We just simply update the PC to that value. So we load the value of that memory address into the memory data register and then send it on to the PC. Right. Thus, we will then begin executing at the subroutine or the service routine location. How do we get back to the caller when it completes? Well, we can simply just place R7 or update R7 to the PC. We can jump to R7 when we're done. 
any questions about that? And this is a very simple way to facilitate a subroutine or a service routine call. And we're just simply updating the PC to execute at the location of the subroutine. And that's a lot of talking. Luckily, we had a, a few good illustrations there. Uh, so if you have any lingering questions, feel free. I'll go ahead and pause for 20 seconds to see if anyone's typing any questions. All right, guys, that's great. All right, so to continue with this illustration, our trap mechanism. So here's a, a memory map here. And here, let's say we have some user program which has, we've split up into some portion A and C. And in between these two portions of our program, we make a service call here, which is indicated by our trap call. So here we're executing, executing, executing all of these instructions and this A component of memory. And then we hit the trap service routine. So what do we do here? First, we go to the appropriate trap table index. Here, we go to 23 hex, right? This is two, three hex. So we go to memory location 23, which is the 23rd entry in our trap table. At that memory location exists a memory location where the service routine uh, exists. That's here, so that's at 4A0. And thus, we update the PC to 4A0. We then begin execution at the service routine. We then execute the service routine. And then the last thing, we want to hand control back. How do we do that? Well, we know that the way back was stored in R7. So we just simply jump to R7. This simply says to update the value of the PC to the address stored in R7. Okay, that'll take us right back to the previous PC value. And then we can begin and continue executing here with our user program. Not bad, right? Seems like a good plan. What could possibly go wrong, right? Well, things could possibly go wrong. Let's see what could possibly go wrong. Okay. For simple cases, this seems to work just fine though, right? And we still haven't necessarily talked about any passing of parameters or return values uh, or some other complications we might encounter. But again, for the simple case, this seems to work just fine. All right, so different issues we could encounter. You know, how do we get back? We already discussed this, and James noted we need to store this value somewhere. By standard, we'll store it in R7, let's say. Okay. Uh, concerns we haven't addressed yet, how are input arguments passed and how are return values returned? Uh, well, one simple solution to this is, and you guys could probably guess this, is we could just simply use registers by some standard, and we could standardize them for particular service routines. Or we could, have some sort of predetermined memory location, right? So as long as we have some sort of protocol in place and the programmer or the assembler knows about these protocols, then we should be able to alleviate some of these data concerns, at least many of them. One issue though that we might encounter or uh, that we haven't necessarily addressed explicitly here is what happens if there is some sort of data validity concerns? What do I mean by that? Let's go back to our example here. Let's say that our user program here, A, in, in section A here, our program was computing some very long computation and it was using registers 
two through four to do this computation. And so registers two through four had some temporary calculations that were needed to finish computing in section C here. Okay. So registers two, three, four being used. But then user program hands control off to service routine. Let's say that service routine also just happens to use registers two through four to do some other calculations. So what's going to happen here? Well, service routine in, in part B here is going to clobber those values in registers two and four, two through four, return control back, and then all of the subsequent computations in the user program are no longer going to be valid. Does that make sense? And since we have a shared resource here, these registers are shared between multiple programs or multiple routines. Right? And we don't necessarily have any fail-safe in place to make sure that these values aren't going to be clobbered right, from one of, these, right, one of these users of this shared resource. You guys with me? Does that make sense? Any questions about that? And so that's sort of what I'm discussing here, not so succinctly in this uh, bullet point. All right. So, how can we assure that we had we alleviate these data validity concerns? Right? That is, some subroutine doesn't corrupt or clobber uh, some register value that's being used currently. We could save temporary copies of them. So, who's going to do the saving? Should the caller do the saving, or should the callee do the saving? Right? And so, the answer to that question could be, well, either, and we'll call them two different things. And we can call it a callee save protocol or caller save protocol. And there's pros and cons to each. And the caller, of course, knows which registers it's currently using, but it doesn't know which one the callee is going to clobber. And callee save protocol has the benefit of the fact that the callee knows which registers it's going to clobber, but it doesn't know which ones the caller is going to use. And so each entity here sort of knows some information, but not all of it. Right? However, using caller or callee save protocol will be fine. And here's an example of a clobber event. I'm not going to step through this, some of the examples in the code here, but I encourage you to go over them to convince yourself that there are issues and that we can remedy them. Right. Again here, there's a clobber event. Particularly, we clobber R7, which is a bad register to clobber. Right? That's your way back. Don't clobber R7. All right, so callee save protocol, the callee saves any of the registers that it's going to be altered by the callee. Caller save protocol, the caller saves all the registers that it's currently using. That's it. Simple protocols. They're saved to temporary memory locations that are accessible by the caller and or callee. Right? And theirs are simply saved and then restored appropriately. So illustratively, what does this look like? Again, here we have a memory map. This one I drew by hand, as you can tell. And here we have some procedure. Let's say it's using registers two through five. Before we jump to the subroutine, we're going to save these registers to some memory location nearby to store these temporary values. So we're saving them so that when we hand control off here to the subroutine, and the subroutine clobbers those registers and then hand control back, we can restore them by just simply copying them back up to the registers. 
and then continue with the instruction. So this is a good example of caller save protocol. The caller will just simply save all of its intermediary work or anything it needs to save before it hands control off and loses control of the registers. And before continuing execution, the saved values are restored and then execution continues. Callee save protocol is similar, except the callee does all the saving, not the caller. And so control is handed off to a subroutine. The callee then saves any of the registers that it knows will be destroyed within its execution. Right. It then runs the subroutine and clobbers all those registers, but then restores them before handing control back. Right, so the callee, in, in a sense, is going to make a mess, but then clean it back up before handing control back. All right, so here's an example of using a trap instruction. All right, and here we see the callee save protocol example. So here, before our service routine executes, Right. The service routine begins here. The service routine ends here. This is return, which is just jump R7. Right. Before the service routine does anything, it saves R1 and saves R7. And it saves it down here in these two memory places, which have just simply been reserved. Right. The service routine then executes. And then before handing control back, it restores the value of register one, restores the value of register seven, and then hands control back to the user. And a really good example of callee save protocol. All right, guys, so we went over a lot of information there with respect to caller and callee save protocol. Are there any questions about caller and or callee save protocol? Now, I don't want to give you guys any misinformation or, uh, or direct you inappropriately, and as I'm not going to be writing your midterm. But and in, I'd say 75% of my midterms, there's been a question of concerning caller and or callee safe protocol. And it's, the concept is important. And so uh, if you do have any questions, certainly do not hesitate to ask. And you also have a few homework questions discussing this. All right, so. Here we have one more conundrum. Can a service routine call another service routine? Right, sure, why not? Right, we have subroutines calling subroutines all the time. So what could possibly go wrong? So let's think about this. Go ahead and type in the chat box when you think you know what's going to possibly go wrong here. So if we have some program that's executing, and then subroutine A is called, and then let's say subroutine A executes, which calls subroutine B, what's going to go wrong in this instance? At least given the protocol that we've specified. What do you guys think? What could possibly go wrong here?
Right, exactly. Right, note here that we have two ways back that we need to save in a sense, but we only have one R7, right? Right, so as soon as we uh, jump to subroutine A, the address uh, here, address one, is going to be stored in R7, which is our way back, so that subroutine A can get back to right, the caller. However, when subroutine A calls subroutine B, this subroutine call is going to immediately store address two, this address, into R7, thus clobbering our address one. And thus, we'll be able to get back one way on this function call chain. We won't be able to propagate all of the rest of the ways back. Right. Does that make sense? Right. So how can we fix this? Well, just like with our other data validity issues, if we store temporary copies of our registers right, before handing control off to a callee, we can preserve the data. Right? And so that's what we'll do here. Something similar to a caller save protocol or a callee save protocol. And we'll just simply save temporary versions of R7 right, before handing control off to the caller or callee. And so here, our original program is executing. Hands control off to subroutine A. Subroutine A executes. Before calling subroutine B, saves the way back. Then hands control off to subroutine B, which executes. Jumps back to R7. Here, subroutine A then restores R7 before continuing execution and then jumping to R7. Thus, we have temporary copies of the way back at each stage of our function call chain, thus allowing us to return back to the caller at each stage of our function call chain. And again, we're able to alleviate this concern but just by simply invoking either a caller or callee safe protocol. Any questions about this solution? All right, and I'll go one further if you guys don't have any questions about this. Does anyone see a problem with this solution or will this solution work in all possible cases? Right. Does implementing a caller or callee safe protocol work for all of our concerns that we've noted thus far? What do you guys think? You can guess. Don't be, don't be afraid to guess. You could say, yeah, it seems like it's going to address all of our issues, or, or it seems to, or maybe not. It doesn't address this issue. And you guys are very shy today. Well, I should be fair. James is not is is not being shy. Right, but and so James notes, it seems like everything is gonna be okay. So what do you guys think? Do you guys think everything's going to be okay? Is this going to alleviate our concerns? I have a, I have a quick comment about that. What if we have um what if we have like more subroutines? How are we gonna able to um, keep them. Can you hear me? Yes, can you, uh, can you repeat the question? Uh, what if we have more subroutines? Right. Yeah, so if we have uh, subroutine A, subroutine B, subroutine C, subroutine D, right, as long as we save a temporary version of the way back right, within each of these subroutines, 
and restore it before hang, handing control back to the caller, we should in theory be able to maintain this function call chain as long as we have in distinct subroutines. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. All right, Roberto thinks that the question is a trap. No pun intended, Roberto, right? All right, but the key point there uh, is that this will work as long as the service routines or subroutines are distinct. All right, and so that's the, the hint that I'll give you. So there are cases where this is not going to work. Right? We won't address them in our slides today, but you guys will address them soon. All right. So what we're going to do now, so I think rather than taking a break here, we'll just sort of finish up these slides and get out a little bit early. Uh, and that's our sort of our brief intro into the idea of a trap routine and service routine. And the next few slides simply just extend this concept and indicate that, well, we can have service routines and subroutines in the, U in the kernel space or in the operating system, for example. Right? We can also have these things these subroutines in the user space, right? User programs can, of course, have subroutines, right? That's a great idea. Right. Uh, our service routines, though, provide its three main functions, right? These are shield the programmer from specific system details, right? Frequently use code just once, right? One of the main benefits of a function or a subroutine, and protect our system resources. Right. Having protected service routines is a good idea. Right. Right. Subroutines, of course, also exist in the user space. Right. Uh, from a very mechanical and practical standpoint, a subroutine is simply a program fragment. Right. We'll say that it lives in the user space when we call it a subroutine. We'll say it lives in the kernel space if it's a service routine. Right. It performs some well-defined task invoked by some caller, right, and returns control when completed. I'd like a service routine, but not part of the operating system. You guys know all of the good reasons for having well-organized code and functional code and modular code, right? Functions are good, subroutines are good. Right. I've already drawn, I think my illustrations are way better than this one, right? This is a canned illustration, which discusses, you know, calling and returning. I feel like my illustration was, was much better. This one's just too rigid, too neat lines crossing. No, maybe I should be an artist. That's just, that's, that's it. All right, so in our LC3, how do we perform subroutine calls? Well, if we have a service routine, we call a trap function or a trap instruction. If the subroutine exists in the user space, we have two different instructions in our LC3 instruction set architecture to facilitate a subroutine call. And that is JSR and JSRR. That's simply just jump subroutine. Right, the jump subroutine instruction is 0100 opcode. Right. And then we have a PC offset, which is 11 bits. All right, 11, bit number 11 is a control bit, which indicates whether we're doing a register-based offset or a PC-based offset. All right, so this indicates that we have a PC offset. This one bit here indicates we are PC relative zero indicates register relative. Right. So we compute the target address where the service routine, or excuse me, the subroutine exists in memory by simply adding this offset to the current PC right, and then jumping to that location, meaning updating the PC to that memory value. Right. So what does that look like? Again here, whenever we call a subroutine, whether it's a trap or in the user space, the first thing we do is save the way back. And so there we go, save the way back. That should be your knee jerk reaction. Always save the way back. Right, that's built into the instruction. 
right? So it's automatically done for us, which is great. And then we compute the target address, which is we need to get the offset here, the PC offset, sign extend it, get the current value of the PC, add them in the ALU, and then update the PC appropriately, thus in effect jumping to our target address. And the other jump subroutine example, no, I'll have a question, I'll go back. Okay, yeah, so perfect question, James. So what does it do when it's a zero? All right, so zero indicates that we have a register-based mode rather than PC offset mode. And so what does that mean, James? It just simply means that we take right, the address that's stored in some register, which is indicated in bits eight, seven, and six. Okay and then simply update the PC to that value. And so what does that look like? And that looks like this. If we encounter jump JSRR, that simply says number one, store the way back. Number two, go to the base register, which was indicated in the instruction, take the memory location that's stored there and update the PC to that. So just simply jump there directly. And so that's the difference between JSRR and JSR. Again, the opcode is the same. The difference between them is bit number 11, our control bit. And it's just like, it's the same instruction, it's just whether you're using a PC offset or the register as the base address. And so here's a question I'll pose to you guys, and it will, it's sort of in line with some of the topics covered in project three that we've discussed most of the discussions in project three and the concepts needed to complete project three already. So what important feature does JSRR provide that JSR does not? So I'll go back to JSR. What limitations do we have here with JSR that are not necessarily limitations within JSRR? Again, think about the constraints of our offset here when answering or thinking about this question. Right, James, exactly. Right, it's similar with any of our instructions here where we have some sort of PC offset. Right? Since we're limited in the number of bits here that we can encode in the offset, we're limited with respect to how far we can jump away from the current value of the PC. Again here about plus or minus uh, 512. So what does that mean? Right. Well, we're limited. We can only jump so far using JSR, whereas with JSRR, right, we're loading up a value that's stored in a register. The registers are 16 bits. Our address space is also 16 bits, so we can jump anywhere in memory in our LC3 using JSRR. And because we can store all memory values, within any of our registers. Okay. Right, great observation. Okay. In our LC3, note that jump R7 will just simply is a common uh, instruction you'll see. That's a way to hand control back to the caller. Right. It's common enough that it has its own pseudo op. So the assembler will translate RET to the binary uh, counterpart of jump R7, just simply jumps to R7, changes the PC value to the value of R7. Right. So here's an example of a negation instruction. 
a few things to note with respect to this subroutine. And in particular, this, this subroutine is being used to just simply negate the value in R0. And it's like a choose complement subroutine of sorts. So here we jump to twos complement. We're executing this. Let's say we jump to the subroutine called twos complement, which exists up here in memory. If we write this out using JSR in assembly, we need to make sure that this line of code is within 1024 or 512 memory locations of this subroutine here. Otherwise, we'll get an assembly error. Otherwise, you'll need to use a different instruction and a different format for that instruction because JSRR expects a register operand. Also note here in this subroutine, neither caller nor callee save protocol is used. So this is something we would also want to fix. And passing arguments to and from subroutines is also a concern. In order to do this appropriately, right, both the caller and callee would need to be on the same page. And of course, the programmer would need to know this information, whether the programmer or the person writing the code is a human or whether it's an assembler or a compiler. Intuitively, and at least for the simple case, we could pass these values using registers. Again, this isn't always going to work, it isn't necessarily always the best, but uh, it certainly has its pros. And in order to appropriately use any subroutine, again, the programmer or the assembler needs to know its address, what it does, its inputs, and its outputs. And pretty intuitive, of course. And again, the Data validity protocol being used is going to be no, needed to know right, by the programmer and or assembler. Generally, callee save protocol is, is preferred. Though again, using caller or callee save protocol will ensure validity as long as the protocol is strictly adhered to. Right. The last few slides in the slide deck is just simply an example of writing a subroutine. And I'm not going to spend the, the final 10 minutes of class here stepping through all of that, right? but instead I encourage you guys to step through it and uh, just convincing yourself that it makes sense, identifying where call safe protocol was being used and how the subroutines are being invoked appropriately here. And I added some comments and highlighted the comments that were key points to our discussions in class here today, right, indicating where JSR and the saving of the way back in R7 are important. And so this is a good example, right, these two algorithms, to just sort of scan through and make sure that you understand what's going on and that you're ready for the homework, for example, where you're going to be asked a few more questions like this. All right, lastly, oops, uh, one side note to wrap things up. And in many instances, you may be, you the programmer, right, or the compiler, maybe calling subroutines that are in a different file. And these files will eventually be concatenated, as you guys will be reading about, that is linked right, and then loaded together in one executable image. Right. However, it's unclear where these subroutines are going to exist in memory relative to the invoking of the subroutine. Right. So should you use JSR or should you use JSRR? Well, since you don't know where it's going to be, you should use the more flexible of the options, such as JSRR. Right? And then, of course, you'll need to have a way to load that address 
into a register before the jump subroutine is called. Right. However, the assembler is going to give you, you know, an error message if you try to load an address that isn't defined in the same file. Right. And most, most assembly languages or assemblers have a way around that, indicating that this address is going to be supplied later on. Right. And usually that, ex that command is something like external or extern indicating that the target address is not known yet, but it will be provided at the linking stage right, of compilation. And so don't give me an error right now because we expect this value to be known right, before the executable image is loaded. And just, one, just one side note there, and if you read about that in Pat Patel, that's where that's, where that's coming from. All right, guys. Well, as I noted, at this point, you guys are ready to complete project three, really. You've already been loaded with all that information. And homework number four as well. You guys have any lingering questions for me before we sign off today? Looks like uh, I think James had one more question that I didn't address. So James asks, uh, is JSRR and jump essentially the same? Uh, they're partially the same, James. That's a really good question. They're not completely the same. Uh, the, both, will, both will jump to a subroutine. Right? And if you encode that you want to use register 7 and JSR, then the uh, to if you encode uh, register seven, then it's just like jump uh, R7, right? Uh, or jump any of the registers. Uh, the one thing that JSR does do that jump doesn't do is that it saves the current value of the PC in R7, right? Jump subroutine is being used to jump to a subroutine, so it's gonna save the way back. Whereas jump does not necessarily do that. Does that make sense? That's a good question, James. Okay, great. Uh, Roberto asks, how in depth does the lab report have to be? Yeah, be very concise in the reports, Roberto. Uh, these are to be an exercise in technical writing. Right? Technical writing is to be very precise, but very concise. And feel free to use images and figures rather than paragraphs. If, take, if you're writing code or if you're running it in a simulator, take a screenshot rather than, rather than saying what uh, you see. And take a screenshot and put it in a figure and then just explain the figure in one or two sentences. Um, you know, don't use two words if one word will suffice. Right? The only thing that you should maybe address a little bit more substantively are the answers to the questions. Again, you can certainly be, if it's a simple question, that only requires a direct answer, right, or a concise answer, right? Then feel free to be direct, <clears throat> direct and concise. Does that make sense? Awesome. Hi right, guys, if there's no other questions, I'll go ahead and let you guys go. Uh, thanks again for joining me remotely and uh, enjoy the remainder of your class. I might pop in from time to time to say hello, right? but uh, Professor Neaton will be taking over.